Now that you understand relative time, we're going to talk about absolute time, which is the idea that we can actually put ages on events, geologic events like the eruption of a volcano or the date of metamorphism in some cases. Um, and the way that this is done is with a little bit of math, but we use isotopes to determine the age of an event. And you may remember from chapter three when we talked about chemistry briefly, that an isotope is an atom that has an irregular number of neutrons in the nucleus. So just to remind you and reconnect some of those synapses in your brains, this is what an atom looks like. Well, this is a model of an atom anyway, where you can see that the nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. And then there are electrons that zoom around outside of the nucleus of the atom. So what's true is that for most atoms, like for example, for most atoms of carbon, over 95% of all carbon in the universe um, has, a, has six neutrons in its nucleus. By definition, they all have six protons. Anything that has six protons, end of discussion, is an atom of carbon. Um, but for neutrons, that can vary a little bit. So most atoms of carbon have six neutrons, some have eight, and those that are, have eight are called isotopes. And what can happen with these isotopes is that they can spontaneously decay. One of the reasons that they spontaneously decay is that there's the additional neutrons make it hard for the nucleus to kind of hold itself together so that it will spontaneously emit a high speed particle and a tremendous amount of heat. During the process, of radioactive decay, a couple things happen. There are a variety of ways that the decay can occur. Um, your textbook actually talks about three different ones. You don't have to know about them. What you do have to know is that during the decay, the number of protons in the nucleus change. So remember what I just said, that all atoms that have six protons in the nucleus are carbon. So if the number of protons of carbon changes during this radioactive decay, what ends up happening is the actual atomic number changes because the atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. If the atomic number of a particle changes, then what forms is actually a different atom. So most people have heard of radiocarbon dating. Um, radiocarbon dating does involve the isotopes of carbon um, where at the end of it, carbon has actually turned into nitrogen. So let's look at those terms just a bit more. The new atom that's formed is called the daughter atom or the daughter product. These are my daughter products. Um, but the isotope is often referred to as the parent. So the parent transitions into the daughter atom during radioactive decay. So the transition from carbon to nitrogen is very simple. It is a one step decay and then nitrogen is a stable um, daughter product. And that's sort of the end of the decay. Some daughter atoms are unstable. And what that means is that they still don't have an atomic configuration that is typical. So they will continue to decay, um, sometimes in many, many steps, and you will have a series of decays that in the worst case scenario really can look like this. Um, this is a very long decay process. This is the decay process of an isotope that's called uranium-238 and uranium-238 decays over a series of 14 steps to lead-206. So the parent, uranium-238, decays over a period of about four and a half billion years, half of it decays, to thorium-234, which decays to protactinium-234, which decays to uranium-234, to thorium-230, to radium-2, you can see, right? This is a 14-step process that starts with uranium-238 as the parent isotope and ends with lead 206 as the stable daughter atom or the daughter product. Um, what we see here is something called a half-life um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide actually. But this it, are the different methods of radioactive decay that again you don't have to worry about at all but just so to explain what those are on your slide. So the word half-life um, refers to the time it takes for, oops, sorry about that, for half of all of the parent isotope to decay into the daughter uh, product or the daughter atom. 
Um, and so this slide shows if you had an atom, or if you had a mineral, and it had a hundred isotopic, um, or uh, yeah, a hundred isotopes that were parents um, in this, stuck inside this uh, mineral, after one half-life, I go up here, and 50% or 50 of those parents have turned into daughters after one half-life. After two half-lives, um, 25 of those parents still exist, and now there are 75 daughters, and so on and so forth. So I usually tell my students, imagine that I give you $100, and every day I ask you for half of it back. So that's your half-life. Um, so if in a hundred, if I give you a hundred dollars, after the first day you'd give me fifty dollars, and you'd have fifty dollars. After the second day, you'd give me twenty-five dollars, and I'd have seventy-five dollars. After the third day, you'd give me twelve dollars and fifty cents, and I would have eighty-seven fifty, and so on and so forth. I never get all my money back, but you have like a hundredth of a cent. Um, but that's sort of the logarithmic decay of parents to daughters over time. Um, every different isotope has its own half-life and what's important to know is this decay occurs at a constant rate. So the reason that's important to know is because if we can collect all the number of parents and all the number of daughter atoms we can use this like a giant clock because we can rewind it in time to when all the daughters that we had used to be parent isotopes if we know the rate that parents turn into daughters. And then we can calculate the age of the mineral, how long ago it was that all of the daughters were parents. Now we can only do this if there are certain parameters that are kept. Um, and so these assumptions have to be true in order for you to get an accurate age for a mineral or for a rock. So the first assumption, geologically, is the hardest um, to guarantee that it's true. And the first assumption is that you have a closed system. So the mineral that you're sampa sampling has to be in a rock that um, basically isn't eroding, because if it's eroding, then you could be losing daughters and parents to erosion and weathering. Um, also, it means that no new um, parents or daughters are brought into the rock by groundwater. Um, so a closed system is basically um, if you and your family were in your house and no one could go out and no one could come in. Um, you're trapped inside your house basically, um, which is a timely, timely reference. So um, a closed system means, again, no new parents or daughters have come in and no parents or daughters are going out. The second assumption is that there is a constant decay rate. This is a very um, reliable assumption because decay rates are actually recalculated every single time an isotopic uh, research project is being done, and that's basically every day. Um, so radioactivity was discovered in 1902. Between 1902 and 1950, there was a lot of refinement of decay rates, but really, honestly, there have been some the redefinition of decay rates. They've been proven over and over and over again um, by scientific uh, research. And so the odds that this is false and that you're violating this assumption are almost zero. So because of the shape of cr the crystal structure of minerals, it's also equally unlikely that there were initially any daughter products that were present inside the mineral. And the reason for this is that atoms are actually different sizes. I know we always think of them as being incredibly small, but an atom of zinc is a very different size than an atom of lithium, for example. So what that means is that big atoms take up big spaces in the crystal structures of minerals, and little atoms take up little spaces. It turns out parents are usually really big atoms, and their daughters are usually significantly smaller. So you wouldn't have a big hole in a crystal structure that's filled by a tiny little atom. Um, you'd have it filled with a big atom. So based on the shape of most crystal structures, um, it wouldn't make sense for any of those daughters to have initially been present. Okay. The next is that there has been no reheating or metamorphism of the mineral um, since its initial cooling. So the reality is, is that you actually can do 
um, isotopic dating of a rock. But what you'll end up with is not the date that the mineral formed, you'll actually end up with the date that the rock was metamorphosed. In this particular class, we don't do anything remotely that complicated. We're not going to be looking, we're going to be looking at one step decays where parents turn right into daughters. And um, I'm not going to be giving you any sort of chemical formula. They're kind of like word problems. There won't be any metamorphic rocks that you're looking at. We're really strictly looking at igneous rocks. We don't look at sedimentary rocks either because sedimentary rocks are usually formed from sediment from a whole bunch of different sources. And so you might have a really old rock that is uh, weathering. And so you have really old minerals in a rock that is currently kind of forming. Um, so sedimentary rocks are not great for um, isotopic dating. Igneous rocks are the best. Metamorphic rocks, you get the age of metamorphism. So um, I want you to know that there are plenty of situations where these assumptions have been um, violated and as a result people get answers that don't really make a whole lot of sense um, when uh, they're using isotopic dating and all of these assumptions had to be learned over time um, that all of these things have to be true in order to get the correct answer. It's kind of like the first time you make a, a new dish you're going to screw it up a little bit but you learn something along the way. So there are plenty of studies, especially studies from the 50s and 60s, where people got really erroneous data. And that's, again, because people were just kind of learning what this process was and how they can use it correctly. So we're going to practice it a couple times, and then I'm going to give you an assignment where you practice them with additional questions. So here's our first question. So here's our first problem. During analysis, samples from Dyke A right here. Um, contained 350 parent atoms and 1,050 daughter atoms. So let's see, there we go. So that seems like useful information. 350 parents and 1,050 daughters. Bear with me, I'm not, I'm not an expert at this at any stretch. All right, how many half-lives have occurred since this sample formed? So Remember our assumption that all the daughter products used to initially be parents? Um, if that's true, when we have 350 parents, that means we used to have 1,050 more parents. So to figure out how many parents we used to have, what we do is we add these two numbers together. So we take 350, ooh, this is great, um, and then we add in 1,050. Ooh, and that equals, <laughs> perfect, 1,400 atoms that were all initially parents. And our current circumstances show that about 350 of them are still parents, and 1,050 of them have turned into daughters. So we need to figure out how, we need to figure out how many half-lives that took. So if you always set this up the same way, you will always get the right answer. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take these 1,400 atoms. Now those used to be my all parents. And in the first radioactive decay, what happened is that 700 of them stayed parents, right? Because 50% of them stay and 50% of them turn into daughters. So 700 of them <laughs> turned into daughters. Oh, I have to get smoother at this. Okay. So that's not our current situation, right? We only have 350 there right now. So what that means that is that there was more than one half-life. So we have to keep going until we get to this 350 number. So we do it again. We take 700, and that's the parents that we still had sitting around after one half-life, and we do a second half-life. And half of 700 is 350 parents. Ooh, that sounds familiar. In the second half-life, we also made 350 new daughters. So, if we made 700 daughters, and then we made an additional 350 daughters, if you add those two together, you get 1,050 daughters total. Now those numbers should both sound familiar to you because when we sampled Dyke A, there were 350 parents, check, and 1,050 daughters, check. So now we go back to the question, how many half-lives have occurred since the sample formed? 
Boom, there's our answer right there. There have been two half-lives since the sample formed. So let's do a second one. If the radioactive isotope had a half-life of 3,000 years, at what time did dyke A cool? So one of the things that we just measured was that there have been two half-lives, right? I'm going to abbreviate half-lives HL. And we just read here that there are 3,000 years in a half-life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply two half-lives that we knew occurred in the last problem multiplied by 3,000 years per half-life. I was in grad school before I realized that units tell you exactly what you should be doing. Because look at here, my units cancel. Half-lives cancel with half-lives. My answer is going to be in years. And 2 times 3,000 is 6,000 years. 0, 0, 0 years. So that's cool. Then I go back to my question. At what time did Dyke A cool? Look, Dyke A cooled 6,000 years ago. So I'm going to take you through one more practice problem, and then I'm going to set you free on a couple additional ones. So an isotope found in the batholith, look there, there it is, our beautiful batholith, um, has a known half-life of 100 years. Okay. Previous research has suggested that the batholith cooled 400 years ago. So right there, let's stop. If there's a half-life every 100 years, and there has been 400 years since it formed, then there have been exactly four half-lives that have occurred, right? So it's kind of like if every 100 years you give me half of my money back and there's been 400 years since I gave you money, then you gave it back to me four separate times. So this is 400 years divided by one, oh, I guess I'll write that out, sorry. 400, oh, I gotta get better at my zero, years divided by 100 years per half-life equals four half-lives. Cool. So let's keep going. If there were originally 10,000 isotopes, those are your parents, if there were originally 10,000 isotopes present, how many will remain today and how many daughter pro products have formed over time? So that means we have to take our 10,000 and decay it four times because we just determined that there had been four half-lives. All right, so let's do that. So we have, <laughs> I'm just gonna write 10K for 10,000. Okay, so in the first half-life, and we know we have to do this four times, we are, all right, I'll just write it out. No more extra letters. We're gonna have 5,000 parents that stick around during that decay, and then we're also going to make 5,000 new daughters. All right, we know we have to do this four times, so we're gonna do this again. So 5,000 parents during our second half-life. Um, what happens is half of 5,000 is 2,500. And now we know we have 2,500 new daughters because half of our isotopes remain parents and half of them turn into daughters. We know we have to do this four times, so we go back, we take our 2,500 2, parents, they're sitting there, and during the third half-life, they turn into, we keep, they're not turning into anything yet, we're going to keep half of them, which is 1,250 parents and we're gonna make half of those 2,500 turn into daughters, which is 1,250. So this is daughters and daughters. And we know we have to do this one more time. So we're gonna take our 1,250 that are sticking around still. And during the fourth half-life, um, what will happen is 625 of them will stay parents and we will make 625 new daughters. So let's go back to our question. 
If there were originally 10,000 isotopes present, how many remain today? Boom, 1,625 remain today. I'm sorry, whoa, 625. 625 isotopes remain today. And how many daughter products will have formed over time? Well, to get that, we have to add up our whole pile. And when we add those all together, we get whoops, 9,375 daughters. Now, since this is a closed system, if you add up your parents and your daughters, you should get what you started with. And when you take 9,375, you add 625, you get 10,000. So that's your little check that you did it properly. Um, I don't want you guys to worry so much about the math. Um, I want you to know that on your next exam, you are allowed to use a four function or calculator or an online calculator. Um, so don't stress about that. All right, we're going to do one more problem. All right, we're going to do one more practice problem together. And that is here. In order to double check the half-life of an isotope, you analyze data from the sill right here. And you have calculated an age of 1200 years old and your spectrometer, which is the machine that you use to actually measure um, the number of isotopes and daughter atoms, uh, reports that your sample contains 20 isotopes and 140 daughters. So how many half-lives have occurred in that 1200 years and what is the half-life of this isotope? So there's sort of a rhythm to these problems. After you do them a few times, you'll find that um, it's fairly repeatable. So the first thing you do is remember all your daughters used to be parents and you add those together and 20 plus 140 is 160. So there were 160 initially and there's 20 remaining today. So we need to figure out how many times 160 has been halved to get to 20. So let's start this fun. All right, so in the first half life, we know that half of 160 is 80 parents. And those are the ones that stuck around and 80 of them turned into daughters. And we're gonna keep going until we get to 20. So then I'm just gonna write over here. If you have 80 parents for the second half life, we know that 40 of them will remain parents and 40 of them will turn into daughters. And we have to keep going because we haven't gotten to 20 parents yet, but we will in our third half-life. So the 40 parents that are still remaining, of those in the third half-life, 20 will remain parents and 20 will turn into daughters. So now we have solved part of this problem. Um, so now we've gotten to the part where there's 20 isotopes isotopes or parents left and if we add these up we now have 140 daughters so how many half-lives have occurred here it is three and what is the half-life of this isotope well for that we need to go back to the beginning of the problem where we had this other information the rock the sill is 1200 years old and there have been three half-lives in that 1200 years so we need to figure out how many years there are in a half-life so what we would need to do here, we take our 1,200 year old sample and we divide it by three half-lives that we just calculated. And 1,200 divided by three is 400 years per half-life. And that is the answer to the second part of our problem. What is the half-life of the isotope? 400 years in the half-life of an isotope. So cool. There are five questions for you to work on. I'm going to go back and make my this just a, oh, just an arrow again. There we go. Um, and we're going to talk about, so, so you'll practice those. Um, but I do want to tell you a little bit about how we use this information. Back in chapter one, I showed you this geologic time scale, and it's basically a way that summarizes all the t history of the Earth. And, geolog and there are absolute ages on the geologic time scale that mark the dates of the end and the beginning of eons and eras and periods um, on the geologic time scale. So you see them here, and then you also see them in the expanded geologic time scale 
where the Phanerozoic Eon is greatly expanded. So you can see um, a little bit more of the detail of the history of life. So you see these on the geologic timescale, but initially, which is really cool, um, the whole geologic timescale was put together just using relative ages, um, knowing which fossils evolved and then went extinct when, knowing um, when um, different events seem to happen in the geologic time scale and putting it together using the law of superposition, law of cross-cutting relations, law of original horizontality. After the time scale was created, the numbers were added using isotopic dating in the last 100 years. And the one, there's two things I want you to know about the geologic time scale. Um, the first is that you live in a time period that's known as the Phanerozoic Eon. Phanerozoic, that word part there, fan, should sound familiar, and that means visible. And zoic means life. So we live in the eon of visible life. And the other big eon on the geologic time scale is called the Precambrian. Precambrian really just means before the Cambrian, and that's because if you look here, all of the Precambrian time is compressed down into this little brown box here. Um, and the first eon, or the first period of the Phanerozoic Eon is called the Cambrian period. The Cambrian period is known as really famous, it's called the Cambrian explosion, and it is a time when life really just exploded in the geologic record, and that's mostly because organisms learn how to make hard parts, like shells and teeth and bones, and it's the first time that they appear really in the fossil record and they begin to create the robust fossil record that we have today. So we use absolute ages to subdivide the geologic time scale. We also use it when we don't have a lot of igneous rocks in the area to kind of give us an idea of how relatively old or young different rock layers are. So here we have this is part of actually Bryce Canyon National Park. These are some of the rock layers here. And there's a lot of sedimentary rock layers. Again, they can't really be used for dating, um, but the igneous rocks can. So here's a volcanic ash bed that was deposited between the Morrison Formation and this brown layer here. And the volcanic ash bed has been dated at 160 million years old. Then you can see that there's several other rock layers that were deposited and then you have an igneous dike that intruded through several of those rock layers. That igneous dike has an age of 66 million years old. Um, so what you know is that now we know that the Wasatch Formation here is the youngest rock in Bryce Canyon, but we also know that it's less than 66 million years old, right? Because you have this contact between the igneous rock layer and the Wasatch Formation. In fact, that's a little non-conformity right there. So we have um, the Wasatch Formation is being less than 66 million years old. Then we know that the Morrison Formation is more than 160 million years old because it is deposited beneath this volcanic ash bed. And similarly, we know the Manco Shale here has got to be um, younger than 160 million years old, but then also older than 66 million years old because this igneous dike cuts through it, and that is the law of cross-cutting relations. Cool. So that's how we use absolute and relative time to solve geologic problems.